feeling super excited for this one, man. I I feel like this is going to be a new slate for me. I'm I'm ready to get on track. I'm ready to win some damn bets, and uh, I'm just ready to get a nice little fire roll in here, man. I and I'm I'm feeling good for this card, man. I do have uh, and if you can tell by the title, I'm not only gonna am I gonna be breaking down UFC 224, I'm gonna be breaking down a couple fights on that Bellator 199 card. I actually have one bet for that Bellator. 199 card and it is and indeed a max bet i have two max bets this week and one on this ufc card and one on the bellator card so i'm feeling good man i feel great about my plays i can't wait to talk about them i uh, didn't have time to really go through every single fight so i'm not going to give an absolute in-depth uh breakdown of like you know um look at it looking at this card uh i mean there's not a whole lot of you know, fat in this card. I, in my opinion, every single fight on this UFC 224 card is it has something to offer. Um, but I don't know. We'll 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 see, man. I, I'm I'm just really excited to talk these bets because I am feeling great. So um, why not why not just jump right into it, man? So I do have four cards, in the, four plays in the UFC card, one on the Bellator card. Um, so. Let's just let's just jump straight into it because the first fight of the night actually is a big play for me, man. We got uh, we got Marcus Perez minus three twenty five taking on James Bokhtovic plus two sixty five. Um, interesting. Uh, both guys coming in in their second fight in the UFC. Both guys lost their debut, so zero and one. This honestly is probably a, a loser gets a uh, cut fight, but in my opinion, when I see this fight. I see a mismatch. You know, you look at the uh, the performance of James Bokhnevik. He came in against Trevin Giles. Now, Trevin Giles is a talented fighter. Absolutely. Is Trevin Giles a world beater by any means? No, no, no. He is not. Uh, the way James Bokhnevik went in there, lost that fight, he really had um, – he had, he had nothing for Trevin Giles. And, you know, looking back at James Bokhnevik's uh, pro record – that was his first time going out of the first round. Uh, looking back in James Bokhnevik's record, um, all these guys he's he's beating, he lost his very first pro fight by submission in the first round. After that, he won like eight straight fights by first round submission. But, you know, 4-13, and 22-37, 2-1, and 0-0. Oh and oh. These are the kinds of guys he's beating. He went in there with his very first legit guy in Trevin Giles. And like I said, Trevin Giles isn't a world beater, but he's a solid fighter. Uh, Trevin Giles uh, went out there and looked like he, he looked like a world champ against this guy. Um, James Bokhnevitz is, uh, let's just say, he just, just doesn't belong in my opinion. He, he's not a UFC caliber fighter. Now you got Marcus Perez on the other hand. You got uh, the Brazilian fighting in Brazil. First thing, already on the uh, the checklist of advantages in this fight for me. Um, kid's twenty seven in his prime. He comes in UFC debut against Eric Anders. Eric freaking Anders. Eric Anders was uh, coming off a knockout over uh, Rafael Natal, retired Rafael Natal. He's coming after off of that performance. Um, you know, even before he went in there and fought Eric Anders. He fought uh, Ian Heenish in uh, LFA for the uh, LFA middleweight title. Smoked Ian Heenish, who also was uh, 8-0 undefeated at that time. That was two 8-0 guys going at it with uh, Marcus Perez and Ian Heenish. Um, Heinich, well, however you're saying that guy's name. Either way, man, this dude, Ian Heinich, um, he's no slouch at all. He's an absolute beast, and Marcus Perez is his only loss. He actually rebounded off that Marcus Perez loss with two straight wins. Um that win over Ian Heinich is ten times more impressive than a more impressive than anything I've ever seen from James Bokhnevich. I think this is an absolute mismatch, and I'm very happy I was able to come in and get a 2.5 units on the minus 200. And then um, even a couple days ago, man, I decided to put more on Marcus Perez. I put uh, two more units on Marcus Perez and a parlay with something later in the card. So in total, guys, I do have. Uh, and my laptop's going very slow on me. It's so annoying. Um, yeah, 4.5 units in total on Marcus Perez. Um, feeling really good about this one, man. I feel like he's got the advantage everywhere. I feel like he can beat this guy up on the feet. I think he can take him down and sub him. I think he can take him down and ground and pound him. I, I, I love him wherever this fight goes, man. I think he's easy money. So uh, I'm going to go with Marcus Perez. I'm going to say he gets it done by second 
round TKO. Uh, moving on to the next fight, man. Not going to talk about this one a whole lot, although I do think uh, we got a live dog here in uh, Alberto Mina. So uh, the odds right now, I'll beat him, Alberto Mina plus 180, taking on Ramazan Amiv minus 220. Ramazan Amiv is your uh, typical well-rounded uh, Dagestani uh, fighter, man. He can wrestle. He can strike. He's a good athlete. Uh, he's strong as hell, tough as hell. Um, it's uh, kind of – it's definitely his fight to lose, but Albert, or especially since uh, Alberto Mina, he's 35 years old. He's coming off of a pretty long layoff here. But thing is, it's in Brazil. You never know. It's hard to bet against those Brazilians in Brazil. Um Alberto Mina is a very lethal guy. He could, I feel like he could land anything at any point. I mean, I just definitely wouldn't trust the Russian here. He's definitely the rightful favorite, but I wouldn't trust him with a bet, especially at the current odds, minus 220. Uh, the value is on Alberto Mina because I feel like uh, maybe we could see some kind of disgusting uh, home cook and Brazilian robbery. Maybe we could see him land a, a very low percentage move out of nowhere. Uh, I just don't think uh, Ramazan Amiv, although I do think he wins this fight, I – Minus 220, that's, that's a bit, man. So I actually think Alberto Mina is a live dog here, but I'm, I'm going to pass. I might play a little bit of him on DK. We'll see how that goes. But uh, the smart pick here, uh, I'm going to go with the minus 220 favorite, Ramazan Amiv. I'll say he gets it done by 29-28 uh, unanimous decision. So moving on to the next fight, man. This is my uh, max bet of this card. Uh, I do have uh, – Jack Hermanson, minus 155, taking on Talis Ladies, plus 135. Going to come out and say it. Five units on Jack Hermanson, 2.5 units at a minus 120, and then another 2.5 units at minus 130. So average odds, uh, minus 125, five units to win four units. Um, man, where do I start with this one? I think uh, I think the biggest thing here is, man, is that uh, Talis Ladies is uh, – he, he's a guy on his way out, and you have a guy in his prime, and Jack Hermanson, I think that's the uh, the, the angle of that fight. So, Talos Ladies, I mean, what, I mean, you, you could say a lot of great things about Talos Ladies. We're talking about a guy who has been in the UFC since UFC 69, where he beat uh, Pete Sell. Actually fought Martin Camp in a fight before that, the Ultimate Fighter 4 finale in 2006. So this guy's been in the UFC 12 years. Of course, he was out of the UFC for a little bit. Uh, but ever since he made the second stint back to the UFC in 2013, let's look at his record. He beat uh, Tom Watson, uh, no longer in the UFC, uh, jobber. Beat uh, Ed Herman. We're talking about a guy who's at the end of his career. Uh, Trevor Smith, we're talking about a jobber. <laughs> uh, Francis Carmont, no longer in the UFC, we're, uh, we're talking about a jobber. Uh, Tim Boach, who definitely is probably – his best win in the stint of the UFC. Um, and even then, that was a very sketchy fight, man, with Tim Boach. He almost got knocked out, but he subbed Tim Boach. Then uh, lost to Michael Bisping, lost to Gegard Mousasi, two top ten guys. Uh, submitted Chris Camozzi, who doesn't submit Chris Camozzi. Then there was this one, man, where you really started to see it. Uh, got dominated badly by Christoph Jocko in Brazil, keep in mind. Uh, beat Sam Alvey. If you haven't figured out how to beat Sam Alvey by now, then you probably don't belong in the UFC. And the last time out, um, Brad lost to uh, Brad Tavares. Um, now you got Jack Hermanson, man, who's, you know, before that loss to uh, Tiago, Tiago Santos, he was going out there and looking like uh, Khabib, <laughs> taking down and pounding out Alex Nicholson, taking down and pounding out Brad Scott. And honestly, man, Talis Ladies, we saw him get beat at his own game by Christoph Jocko. Christoph Jocko was able to take him down and uh, dominate him on the ground, which is supposed to be Talis Ladies' strength. And I kind of feel like Jack Hermanson could do that to Talis Ladies here. I feel like he could take him down and beat him up. I feel like Jack Hermanson can keep it standing and knock out Talis Ladies or outstrike him for three rounds, man. So I love Hermanson. Wherever this fight goes, just don't get into a bad position on the uh, ground for sure, man. But. Man, that uh, that loss to Christoph Jocko that Talos Ladies had, that really just kind of sticks out to me a lot. And uh, just to talk about Christoph Jocko for a second. So obviously that Talos Ladies fight was definitely his biggest win, but let's talk about Christoph Jocko for a sec because I'll, I'll admit when I'm wrong on a lot of things, and I was wrong about Christoph Jocko. I thought Christoph Jocko was a future top five guy, but let's actually look at what this dude's done in the UFC. 
uh, came in UFC debut, beat Bruno Santos, no longer in the UFC. Second fight submitted by Magnus Seedenblad. Um, does Magnus Seedenblad even fight anymore? Uh, next fight beat Tor Trong, or however you say the dude's name, the Swedish dude, um, no longer in the UFC. Uh, beat Scott Askham by split, no longer in the UFC. Uh, beat Brad Scott. I mean, have you seen Brad Scott's last couple appearances? Um, knocked out Tamden McCrory, no longer in the UFC. Uh, beat Talos Ladies, then uh, he, he loses his last three fights uh, in a row. Uh, one of them being a, a terrible fight against Dave Branch, and then the next two getting absolutely knocked out badly against Uriah Hall and Brad Tavares. So, man, I don't think Kristoff Jocko is... Uh, he, he He's not an elite fighter by any means, and the the fact that he was able to go in there and dominate uh, Talos Lady, that gives me reason to believe that a, a guy like Jack Hermanson can come in here and dominate Talos ladies even in the home country of brazil because christoph jocko dominated uh Talos ladies in uh brazil so I, I i definitely see it happening again here so five units on uh old jack hermans and here i'm very confident that's probably my most confident uh play of the card uh for sure so yeah man i'm gonna go jack hermans and i say he gets it done by 30 27 decision maybe even a late tko there so Moving on to the next fight, man. Not going to talk about this one a lot. Uh, we got Sultan Aliyev, plus 200, taking on Worley Alves, minus 240. Uh, this should definitely probably be Worley Alves' knockout early. But uh, I kind of feel like if he goes in there and looks for that knockout early and doesn't get it, he could gas himself out and the Russian could take over with the wrestling. So I wouldn't trust Worley Alves at minus 240 here. But he definitely is going to be the pick. I'll say he gets it done by uh, a first-round knockout. Then moving on to this one, man, this is uh, a, another play for me. We got Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos minus 135, taking on Sean Strickland plus 115. Uh, you guys might know I'm a huge fan of Zaleski Dos Santos. This is one of my favorite fighters in the UFC. And uh, I did manage to catch him very early on. Uh, he was at plus money. I got 2.5 units on him at plus 100. So 2.5 to win 2.5. I kind of just feel like he's so good at making fights his fight, that crazy war pace. And although Sean Strickland, he's, you know, he's a lanky dude. He has a good jab. He's a decent athlete. He's got amazing takedown defense, unless he's fighting Kamaru Usman, of course. But I kind of feel like maybe he has success with that jab early. But like I said, man, Elizu Zaleski Dos Santos makes it a war. And I think eventually he'll be able to get past that jab, turn it into a war, and it, that's not going to be a kind of fight Sean Strickland's going to win. I I feel like it's probably going to be pretty similar to the uh, the Ponzinibbio Strickland fight. Elizu Zaleski, he's got more tools. He's going to be throwing more pressure. He's got the Brazilian crowd, ref judges behind him. I feel like this is a good spot. I'm very happy I got plus money. So how can I pass up on uh my, my boy here at plus money? So 2.5 units on uh, Zaleski Dos Santos, and I say he gets this done by 30. 27 decision over Sean Strickland. I think he just got more tools on the feet, more pressure on the feet. Um, so, yeah, I got him 30-27 decision. Moving on to the next one, man. Uh, this fight's going to complete my parlay, uh, that two-unit parlay with uh, Marcus Perez. So we got Davi Ramos, minus 150, taking on Nick Hine, plus 130. Um, this is a weird fight, man. So, Firstly, I'll just say uh, I did parlay two units, Marcus Perez, with the over two and a half rounds in this fight. Uh, I definitely see the over hitting. Uh, I believe every single one of Nick Hines' UFC fights have gone to decision. Uh, and that's kind of how I see it going here. I, I think he's probably got solid enough takedown defense to where Davi won't be able to take him down. So we're probably looking at a striking match. And I think both guys have solid enough chins to where it's just going to be a Three round striking match, simple as that. And even if Davi Ramos can get this guy down to the ground, I think Nick Hine, he can, he's solid sub defense. We've never seen this guy get subbed. Uh, so I, I don't know. I feel like this is just a very, very high percentage uh, fight to go to the scorecard. So I feel very comfortable parlaying the over up in this one. So as far as I who, who I think is going to win, man. Um, I tend to think that uh, Davi Ramos is the rightful favorite here. Uh, I am going to pick him. I'll say 29-28 decision. Uh, again, Brazilian scorecards, uh, Brazilian refs. Uh, 
the odds are in his favor, man. Uh, Nick Hine, he's he's a solid guy. I mean, he had a close fight with James Vick, if anything. Um, I just feel like Davi probably got a little bit more pop behind his punches. He's probably a little quicker. Uh, just more well-rounded fighter. I feel like he should probably get the job done here. Davi Ramos is a solid dude. And, you know, Nick, Nick Hine, he wins fights. So, I, I mean, I wouldn't completely put it against him to uh, pull this one out even in Brazil. It's going to be tough when it, it, this fight is most likely going to go to scorecards, and it's not easy to win those decisions over Brazilians in Brazil. But So definitely Davi Ramos is the rightful favorite. I'm picking him 29-28, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I would definitely feel a little weird about betting him because Nick Hine wins fights. All right, so moving on to the next one, man. We got a nice little heavyweight clash here. We got Junior Albini, minus 155, taking on Alexi Olenek, plus 135. Um, this is a weird one, man. Uh, I, I actually tweeted out a couple days ago. I just, I kind of have no idea what's going to happen in this fight. But since then, I kind of have, uh, thought a little bit more about it. I, I, I'm kind of solid on, uh, Junior Albini. And as I was just making my DraftKings lineups, I, uh, I put him in a few of those. So we'll definitely going to be cheering for, uh, Junior Albini here. I just kind of feel like, um, you know, he, 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 he knocked out Tim Johnson his UFC debut, but I mean, obviously it's that loss against Andre Orlovsky that kind of sticks out to me because he was such a big favorite and he dropped the ball and he was wearing the diaper and all that shit. Um, I uh, I do feel like Junior Albini is a talented guy. He definitely just dropped the ball against uh, Andre Orlovsky, but when we're talking about Andre Orlovsky, we're talking about one of the greatest heavyweights in, of all time, a guy who goes on win streaks. Sure, he's a guy who goes on losing streaks, but look at Andre Orlovsky's record. It's full of Five straight losses, four straight wins, four straight losses, four five straight wins. Um, even at his age, I mean, this is heavyweight. Andre Orlovsky is a—he's one of the greatest heavyweights of all time, man. So can we really blame the kid, the unexperienced young kid, for dropping a fight to Andre Orlovsky? Ah, I don't know. But we got Alexei Olenek, who's another very experienced vet. I mean, we're talking about a guy with seventy fights, but I don't know. I just feel like he's getting very up there in age. He has cardio issues. He has injury issues. Uh, I feel like Junior Albini probably could keep it away from the uh, the mat where Olenek definitely probably wants it because he's so damn sneaky there. I feel like Albini can probably keep it standing and probably even maybe even knock this guy out, but we'll see what happens. I, I feel like probably a, a knockout is the most likely thing for uh, Albini, but I wouldn't be surprised with a three-round sl heavyweight slop fest. I mean, that's that's what we get a lot of the time. So I don't know. It, it's definitely a hard fight to read what happens, but I, I, I'm sold on Junior Albini here, especially in Brazil. So, yeah, I'm going to say Junior Albini wins this fight via second-round TKO. So uh, last fight, main event of the prelims. Wow, huge movement just, just, just came in, and I have to say I definitely agree with it. Uh, wow, this just happened, man. Um, so somebody just put a uh, big money in on uh, Caesar Fajaya. He's now minus one hundred and five. Uh, Carl Roberson minus one hundred and fifteen. Um, I agree with whoever just put that uh, big sum of money down on Caesar Fajaya, man. Uh, he's the uh, he's the better MMA fighter without a doubt in my mind. Uh, he's got the grappling advantage for sure. Uh, I I feel like he's the better athlete. I feel like he's stronger. He's got more experience in the octagon. Uh, He's just got a chin problem. Just don't get caught in this fight. Uh, Carl Roberson is a kickboxer. And let's not get things crazy. He's no elite kickboxer. He's just a guy who's done kickboxing before. He's not the greatest striker in the world. He's average. Uh, if Caesar doesn't get caught, he's winning this fight. Um, Carl Roberson, KO or bust, in my opinion. I feel like Caesar should be close to a minus 140, minus one favor, 150 favor here. Uh, if he doesn't get knocked out, he's going to uh, take down Carl Roberson and submit him or take him down and grind him out. Um, either way, I, I just don't know if I could trust either guy. I think it's – I mean, it, it's definitely reasonable now that it's a lot closer when it was minus 150 Roberson not too long ago, and it still is on some books. That was, it was a little weird to me. But, um, yeah, I, I'm actually going to go with the underdog. I'm going to go with Caesar Fajaya, and I think he gets it done via, I'll say, second round – submission not going to talk about that one that much i but fun fight i'm looking forward to it. we'll see what happens okay so now moving on to the main card we got leono Mashida 
minus 275, take on a Vitor Belfort minus or plus 235. So two Brazilian legends here. Um, but Leonel Machina, man, a lot of money has come in on this guy. If you look at it, the odds opened up, and I'm letting it load for me here. Leona Machida opened up at minus 120. The public has moved him all the way to minus 275. So about a dollar and a half uh, difference between the opener. And I, I guess I agree, man. Leona Machida just went in there and beat, uh, I mean, arguably beat. It was a very close fight. Even then, going to a close fight with a guy like Eric Andrews, who's in his prime, who's a very dangerous guy. That's impressive for Leo Machida, and I think that's a big deal because Leo Machida, for a little while there, was going out and getting his ass beat uh, against the Luke Rockhold, the Ola Romeros, and more recently the Derek Brunsons of the world. So for him to come out and uh, beat an up-and-comer like Eric Andrews, that's a huge deal. Um, and then when you look at the way that Vitor Belfort has been losing fights, sure, Leo Machida is not the kind of guy that he has been going out and losing to, but... I don't know, man. Vitor Belfort off that TRT is just, uh, it, it's honestly just hard to watch. Uh, it just, the, his body is just completely different. It's like watching a, a grandpa going out there and fighting. I mean, sure, he, he can still go out there and knock out a Dan Henderson. And even then, that was a couple of years ago. Um, pick up a win over Nate Marquardt, very close fight. Uh, I just kind of feel like Leon Machida, he's going to be moving around a little bit better in there. He's going to hit Vitor with a lot better shots. And, I'll probably end up winning a decision. I'm going to go with Lieto winning a, uh, I'll say a 30-27 decision here probably. Uh, would a KO surprise me? Definitely not with the way uh, Vitor's chin has been looking. But I'm going to go with Lieto Machida. I'll say he gets it done by 30-27 decision. He has a lot more left in the uh, in the tank for sure. So moving on to this fight, man. This is a very intriguing Bantamweight matchup. We got John, hands of stone, Lineker, minus 255. Taking on Brian Boom Kelleher, plus 215. Um, man, what can you say about Brian Kelleher? He's looked very impressive in the UFC, other than that uh, loss to uh, Marlon Chito Vera, where, you know, people get caught. Marlon Chito Vera's a good grappler. He caught Brian Kelleher. Shit happens. Um, still, even uh, coming off a victory over an ex champ in Hedden Burrow, this is a huge step up because we know Hedden Burrow is not Hedden Burrow anymore. He's the ghost of Hedden Burrow. John Lineker is in his prime. He's a super dangerous guy. Uh, it's just so hard to keep up with this dude's pressure. I just don't know if Brian Killer quite has the wrestling like TJ Dillashaw to take him down. I just don't know if he has the – I don't know, man. I, I feel like he can go in there and make it a close striking battle, but especially in Brazil, John Lineker is going to be landing the harder punches. He's probably going to be landing more. It, it's going to – and I don't see Brian Keller going out there and finishing John Lineker. I think you'd need to win a decision here because, I mean, John Lineker, not only does he have hands of stone, the dude's got chin of stone. So I don't know. I, it's tough. So Brian Keller, I feel like he kind of has to win a decision here. And in Brazil, John Lineker's going to be landing harder shots. I think that's a very tough task. So I think John Lineker's probably the rightful favorite here, definitely at – a. Minus 255. Maybe it shouldn't be that high, but definitely the rightful favorite, and I'm definitely going to have to go with him here. So I'm going to say John Lineker wins this via a 30-27 decision. But for the people going out there and saying he's going to absolutely go go and smoke Brian Kelleher first-round knockout, I think that's a little silly. Um, I definitely give Kelleher the benefit of the doubt saying that he survives. So I think he puts on an admirable performance, but I'll go with uh, – all hands of stone via a 30-27 here. So moving on to uh, Mackenzie Dern. We got Mackenzie Dern minus 245, taking on Amanda Bobby Cooper plus 205. Um, I actually feel like this is a lot easier matchup than her uh, debut in Ashley Yoder because Ashley Yoder actually has some grappling. Uh, Amanda Bobby Cooper kind of just doesn't. Uh, I actually think there's some value on Mackenzie Dern at minus 245, if I'm being honest with you guys. Uh, I don't see Amanda Cooper stuff in the takedown. I think Mackenzie Dern, if it stays striking, I think it's probably going to be close. If not, Bobby Cooper has the advantage there. But, man, looking back at uh, Amanda Cooper's takedown defense, uh, look at that uh, Cynthia Calvillo fight. Really just showed no technique and stuff in the takedown. Uh, 
I think Mackenzie Dern is actually smart and goes for the takedown, which I'm sure she will. I don't think she's that idiotic to where she thinks she can win a striking battle. Uh, I think Mackenzie Dern lands the uh, takedown with ease and probably submits uh, Amanda Cooper here. So I'm going to go with Mackenzie Dern. I will say first round submission. So moving on to the co-main event, we got Hinaldo Jacare Souza. Um, minus 150, taking on Kelvin Gastelum, plus 130. I struggled the, with the pick here for quite a while. I think this is a really tough matchup, but ultimately I am going to go with the favorite in Jacare Souza here. Um, so the thing with Kelvin, man, um, ah, man, the guy's just not a middleweight. He's not a middleweight, if we're being honest. He's a lazy welterweight, and I don't think he can quite compete with the, uh, the elites at middleweight. Um, uh, Jacare Souza, I mean, you look, uh, his most recent loss was to uh, Robert Whitaker. I want to say that was his last loss. Uh, he had the uh, the Whitaker fight and then the, uh, the Brunson fight, right? Okay, good. I'm not going crazy. Yeah, so we lost to Whitaker. Um, you could say, yeah, maybe Kelvin can go in there and uh, avoid the ground game and uh, box up and knock out Jacare just like uh, Robert Whitaker did. Now, first of all... I I, I, I don't think it's quite the same thing. And and also, first of all, Robert Whitaker had to go through some shit. Robert Whitaker got taken down. He got his back taken, and he had to work his way out of it. Um, if Kelvin Gastelum gets taken down and gets his back taken, I don't know if he has quite the fight in him that Robert Whitaker does. I, I don't think he has quite the the technique or he's just – I just don't think he's what Robert Whitaker is. I'm not convinced he can do what he did. Um and not only that, uh, Robert Whitaker, he, if you look at it, he, he finished Jacare with a head kick. Uh, Kelvin Gastelum is not just he, – he, he's not quite the uh, the defensive grappler or the striker as Robert Whitaker. So I, I don't really like to see that comparison that people are saying that he can just do what Robert Whitaker did because I think that's a lot easier said than done. I, I just – I think Jacare comes in here. I think the striking, I give Kelvin the advantage in the striking. I think Jacare can hold his own, but eventually Jacare will get it on the ground. And I think uh, I think he either grinds Kelvin out or he, more than likely, I actually think Jacare submits Kelvin here. So I'm going to go with Jacare Souza via a second round submission. And looking at the props, I'm actually curious what the prop on uh, Jacare via sub is. Jacare via sub is plus 185. That's actually not as juicy as I thought it'd be, but yeah. So I'm going to go Jacare via submission. So moving on to the main event here, man. We got Amanda Nunes. Minus 1,100, guys. Minus 1,100. Taking on Raquel Pennington, plus 700. Um, no surprises here. I'm going to pick the minus 1,100 favorite to retain her belt, but... I do think that line's a little crazy because Amanda Nunes does have a weakness, a clear weakness, in that she fades. She gasses out. And I actually think Raquel Pennington is a tough enough chick to where she can survive initial flurries and take it to the later rounds. And if Amanda Nunes is gassed, she, Raquel Pennington is the kind of girl that'll, um, you know, take advantage of that and maybe even pull off a uh, another bulldog choke. I don't think that'll happen, but, um, you know... <sighs> You never know, man. I don't think you can trust Amanda Nunes at minus eleven hundred here, man. Because, I mean, we've seen it. She she blows that gas tank out. Now she hasn't done it recently. Maybe she's learned her lesson, and there is a reason she's a minus eleven hundred favorite. Um, she's better than Raquel Pennington everywhere for sure. Not even by a little bit, by a lot. So, yeah, I get it. And she's probably gonna finish Raquel Pennington somewhere early, maybe mid into the fight. So. I'm going to go with Amanda Nunes here via, I'll say, third round TKO. But uh, I don't know, man. Don't don't go parlaying minus 1,000s in this spot for sure. So not much to say, uh, not much to break down here. I just think Amanda Nunes is better everywhere, bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic. Uh, so Amanda Nunes, third round finish. I, I, I tend to lean with TKO, but, uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. So that's going to do it for the UFC card just to go back through my uh, four bets. I do have five units on Jack Hermanson, average odds minus 125, 2.5 units on Zaleski Dos Santos, uh, 2.5 units Marcus Perez minus 200, and then two units on a Marcus Perez parlay with the uh, the Nick Hine, Davy Ramos over two and a half rounds. Now I'm going to go over the, uh, the Bellator card really, really quick if I can uh, pull that up here on the, uh, the, the good old tapology. So I do have um, 
5.1 units on the main event here. I'm just going to start with the main event and then kind of talk about the uh, the fights previous. I'm going to go backwards here on the uh, Bellator card. But, yeah, Brian Bader. I got Ryan Bader minus uh, 255, 5.1 units to win two units. Um, y'all are going to see it on weigh-ins, this massive size difference. Ryan Bader is uh, a huge light heavyweight, and uh, King Mo is a uh, average size middleweight if we're being honest here king mo's a small dude um uh i i honestly think ryan bader is going to come in here and have easy work with the wrestling here i think he can uh and not only just the wrestling man now i wouldn't like to see him test the striking but if it were come to a striking match i think ryan bader can absolutely hold his own here in the striking i mean if, if we're looking at king mo man and now i have all respect for king mo in the world and he still gets out goes out and gets good wins People forget King Mo's 37 years old at this point, and uh, I, I feel like Ryan Mader's not that far behind him, but um, he definitely has a lot more left in his career. Ryan Bader is 34 years old, so he hasn't even hit his uh, mid-30. He hasn't even hit 35 yet. Um, he gets a lot more left in the tank. He's the better athlete. He's way bigger. He has a clear advantage with the wrestling. The path is there. Um, I mean, look, look at the run he's on. I mean – Take back that uh the the Anthony Johnson knockout. Um, you know, uh what was that? That is five fight win streak, then lost to Anthony Johnson. Now he's won three or four straight, three of those being finishes. Remember when Ryan Bader did nothing but win decisions? Now he's on a four fight win streak with three finishes over Alir Latifi, uh who's looking amazing, uh little nog. Uh, and then just finished Linton Vassell and then had a uh, decision win over Phil Davis, which was a split. But in my eyes, that was a clear decision for Ryan Bader. Um, so, yeah, man, I think he should go out here. Handle King Mo, no problem here. So max bet on Ryan Bader, guys. 5.1 units to win uh, two units. So Ryan Bader for the win here. Uh, going back to the, uh, the, the card really quick. Uh, this is actually a pretty decent Bellator card, honestly, but it's a shame it's on at the same time as uh, UFC 224. John Fitch versus Paul Daly. Now, there's no odds for these yet unless uh, they showed up while I was doing this. Now, no odds yet, but, man, that's an intriguing one, John Fitch and Paul Daly, because both guys have clear advantages. I'm talking clear advantages. Paul Daly has shit take 10 defense. John Fitch has amazing takedowns. He's such a good grinder. Um, that's a clear advantage. And then when you talk about John Fitch's striking skills and his chin at uh, such an old age as well, um, if Paul Daly can somehow keep this standing, uh, it won't last long for John Fitch. So, uh, I don't know. That's a super tough one for me to pick. Uh, and, it, and, and it's hard to pick this fight with no awe. Uh, um, <laughs> I, I wonder which way the odds makers are going to lean with this fight. I feel like it's probably going to be close odds, but the fight, it starts standing. Uh, I feel like Paul Daly has a little bit more left in the tank career-wise. I don't know, man. That's a super tough pick. I don't know which way to lean. I definitely want you guys to uh, comment below. Tell me who you got between Fitch and Daly because I'm struggling with that one, man. I... I think I'm going to go with Paul Daly, though. I think Paul Daly is going to knock out John Fitch in the first round. Um, I don't even know if he's necessarily going to need to stuff and take down. I actually think he can do it lightning quick. But if John Fitch gets him down once uh, early in the first round, that could be it. So I don't know. That's a really intriguing matchup. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, then you got Czech Congo versus Javi Ayala. That's probably going to be a boring heavyweight slot fest. I kind of have like zero interest in that, although I would like to see Javi Ayala knock out Czech Congo, but probably won't happen. I'll go with Czech Congo via decision. And then uh, Aaron Pico versus Lee Morrison. Uh, Aaron Pico seems pretty special to me, man, so I'm going to go with him here. I didn't look into his opponent a whole lot, but I'll go with Aaron Pico. And then uh, last fight on the main card, actually a really good fight. Carrington Banks taking on Adam Piccolotti. Um, Piccolotti was a very interesting prospect to me at one point, but hasn't been doing very well as as of late, losing to uh, Goody Yamamuchi and uh, David Rickles. Losing to David Rickles is uh, kind of like a big career setback to me. So I'm going to go with the undefeated um, – uh, what's he uh, – is he a Henry Hoof guy? I feel like he's a Henry Hoof guy. I know he's a wrestler, background wrestling, but I feel like he's uh, been working with Henry Hoof and his striking – so uh, I'll go with uh, Carrington Banks here. 
I feel like he'll uh, probably get the better of uh, Adam Piccolotti wherever this fight goes. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, Carrington Banks. So uh, that's going to do it for me, guys. Bellator and two to, uh, UFC 224 in the books. Um, it's nice to be back. I'm glad uh, we got five straight weeks of fights. It's very exciting to me. Follow me on Twitter. I'm down to talk fights with all you guys. Just hit me up in the DMs. Uh, I'm at MMA Kelton. Subscribe because I haven't missed a fight card in almost two years at this point. I'm always doing these. Um, of course, um, comment below. Tell me who you're betting on this weekend. Hit the like button. It takes one second of your time. So that's going to do it for me, guys. I appreciate you all watching very much. You have no idea how much you mean to me. Definitely comment below. I want to get a lot of comments this week. So comment below. Tell me who you're betting on. Thank you guys very much for watching. But most importantly, enjoy the fights this weekend.